No, they, they said they can't hear it back. Yeah, you have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Any better? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, appreciate everybody coming out. My name is Greg Moore. I'm the State Director with Americans for Prosperity here in New Hampshire. We love celebrating this Pine Tree Riot event. We weren't able to do it last year. This is the 249th anniversary, so we felt it was critical, critical that we have this event this year because next year, of course, is going to be the 250th anniversary. Huge, huge event. Uh, an event, event that frankly set the course of American history that, that made America uh, America and not, not have us drinking tea and crumpets at 4 o'clock. <laughs> so uh, the Pine Tree Riot is, it, it is a hugely historical event. And we have a few folks speaking as well uh, after me talking about the significance of it. But I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of it. I don't like to give the full comprehensive version we gave the first few times we had this event. I know I, I don't want to bore you with the 20 minute history lesson. We'll do the condensed version for the, folks, for the folks who haven't been here before. So uh, for those, for those uh, who weren't aware, in the colonial, colonial times, uh, the, the British government saw one great value in New Hampshire. And it was right below me, trees. White pine. Trees and particularly white pine. You see in the build up, uh, the, the British had pretty much deforested the British Isles. Uh, they had they made themselves a naval power on the back of wood, but the, but then in so doing, they no longer had wood in, uh, across most of England and, and the other British Isles. So when they had a chance to come to America and see these huge, pristine forest lands, they said, "Aha, this is what we wanted." And so, what they valued the most was, of course, the white pine. The white pine uh, was exactly a perfect material to make mass for trees. And so one of the things that they did was they said that the king owns, and this is starting in, in the uh, late 17th century, they said the king owns any pine with a, with a diameter of 24 inches or more. Now, we have Tom Thompson who will explain the significance of that uh, and a 24 inch white pine. Well, in 1722, they decided because they wanted to protect the seed stock, they took that 24 inches down to 12. And we have a graphic demonstration of the difference between a 24 inch white pine and a 12 inch below here. So you can see that the, the major difference. Now, the 24 inch wasn't a huge problem, largely because if you took it down a 24 inch white pine, trying to get it out of the forest was no easy task back then. We didn't have skitters back then. It was, a, it, was, it was quite the challenge. So we went, uh, and so when, when they shrunk it down to 12, now you're really starting to talk about what, what a lot of New Hampshire citizens were using as the basic building materials, the basic energy production. It was a critical element of everything that, that was part of the economy, part of housing, and part of the society. And it was the most sought after stock that New Hampshire had. So white pine was, was the, the, the treasure uh, crop that we had in this state. And so when they, when they took it down to 17, in 1722, down to, uh, they first tried to enforce this mandate. And they tried to enforce it once in a town called Brentwood. And uh, the, the surveyor of the woods went out to go and, and found that, yes, in fact, the people the, working the, uh, the yards were, lumber yards were chopping down these, these white pines. And they decided to try to find them for, the, for doing it. And a, a group of these gents got together and gave the surveyor two simple, a, a simple choice. Either he could leave and say nothing of it, or they would kill him. <laughs> That's known as a mass tree riot. Um, and, so, and so there was sort of this sort of happy, uh, unenforced law on the books for about 50 years. No one, no one paid any attention to it. Well, in 1771, th th there was, uh, exactly, government was being very respectful back then. Uh, 1771, there was a new governor came along, and he decided he was leaving a lot of money on the table by not enforcing this law. And so, in late 1771, he sent he sent uh, the surveyor uh, surveyor down to four mills in in Goffstown and two mills here in, in Ware, New Hampshire. Uh, and naturally, he found that there was plenty of white pines greater than 12 inches in in in, in the mill yards, and so he wrote it up. And, and then eventually, they decided to send to send the sheriff Whiting and his deputy to come and collect. Uh, in, in, in between this time, the, the mill owners who, uh, who owned the six mills hired somebody to represent them. His name is Samuel Blodgett. He went up to the he went up to the governor to try to state make the case of, of the mills, 
and, and in turn, the governor actually hired the guy as a surveyor of the land. So that the lawyer that they sent up to represent them actually turned coat, and then he suggested after he became the surveyor that they should just pay their fines. <laughs> This is, this is why lawyers get a bad, bad name, though. <laughs> just want you to know. Uh, and so, and so uh, the, uh, the, 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 they sent out the sheriff and the deputy. Sheriff Whiting came out to go collect the debts. He went to the four Gosstown mills. They paid their debts. They went to the two mills here and where owned by a fellow by the name of Ebenezer Mudgett, and he was having nothing of it. He said, no way. So they decided to arrest him. So they arrested Ebenezer Mudgett, but it was late in the evening. Remember, we, did, we weren't driving around with a paddy wagon here. It was late in the evening, and they didn't have the ability to get, to, to get back home. So they said it was a house arrest, and they, they hoped that he would have a night to, to sleep on it, and he would just pay them in the morning. Well, instead, he had a little bit of a different strategy. <laughs> his strategy instead was to, to round up a number of the town folk, came to his house, and they decided the next morning, early the next morning, they showed up at Quimby's Inn, which is, would have been up on 114, and, and if you drive up 114, uh, you'll see there's, there's a big stone mill that represents the site of the Pine Tree Ride where Quimby's Inn was at the time. And, and they decided to break in and uh, take the sheriff, proceed to hold him up and take switches and hit him one time for each, each uh, log that, uh, that he had claimed that, uh, that, that had violated the king's order. Uh, they then took them out the sheriff and the deputy out, tied them, tied them backwards to their horses, and cut the horses' ears, mane, and tail, which would make one heck of a ride, and rode them right out of town. Now, that in and of itself would be historically significant, and, and I say this because it was actually organized. These people, it wasn't a spur of the, spur of the moment thing like the, like the mastery riot. These folks had time to think about it. They knew what they were doing, and they said that these people were unjustly taking our property. After that, after that, uh, the, the sheriff uh, came and actually act, found a, a major and a captain and they brought their battalions to come out as a posse. Now there were, there were estimated to be over 30 people who participated in the Pine Tree Riot, but they ended up only arresting eight. And the real significance of that, of, of the eight people who had been arrested, they went before, they went before a panel of judges. And the panel of judges decided to, to give them a fine, a fine of 20 shillings which is basically the equivalent of getting a parking ticket for nearly beating a sheriff and his deputy to death. <laughs> and, and the significance of, the, of that is, is because, because the judges, the judges felt as though that this was unjust. The, the judges felt as though the, the, the actual uh, order of, of the governor was unjust. And that is why they felt as though the, the, the penalty matched the crime. That, that, the significance of that is that the word of that traveled and circulated Without that, the Boston Tea Party doesn't happen. Because the Boston Tea Party, they, they, they said, what's the worst they're gonna do is give us a 20 shilling fine? <laughs> so no, no Pine Tree Riot, likely no Boston Tea Party. And this set forward a series of events that uh, began the American Revolution. So that's why I think it's so critical that we, we commemorate the Pine Tree Riot, we put a lot of focus and energy about the history behind it that happened right here in Little Weir, New Hampshire. And, and I think it, it speaks, particularly nowadays, we think about the unjust laws that are being pushed upon us. Um, I'm looking at Jeff Kibbe and thinking about his dealing with his local zoning board. <laughs> and, I, and I can think of any number of more examples here of unjust uh, laws that are being pushed upon us. And the need for citizens to take action and get involved and speak, and, and, and this is really your chance and your opportunity to make sure that these things don't continue to happen. We have to stand up for our rights, we have to stand up for our principles, and we have to stand up for the notion that we are a free people. And that is exactly what Ebenezer Mudgett did. That is the spirit of Ebenezer Mudgett, and that is why the Pine Tree Riot is a historic event, and that's why we celebrate it. Now with that, I want to turn it over to uh, our, our, our uh, freedom-loving guy. He's, he's got an, even an ax to prove it. Our chairman, Tom Thompson, but the, the beauty of, of Tom Thompson being our chair is, he actually is a tree farmer. <laughs> how, how serendipitous is it that you have a tree farmer who happens to be your honorary chairman? So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom Thompson. Thank you, Greg, and thank you folks for coming. Um, this is, as Greg said, a very important event in New Hampshire's history. 
the only sad part about that riot, in my mind, was what they did to the horses. <laughs> Other than that, they, should, they got what they deserved. But remember, the horses were what people traveled with, and particularly uh, in the logging industry, that's how you move wood out of the woods. Uh, before I get say any more, I wanted to uh, just recognize Greg Moore as the head of the New Hampshire Americans for Prosperity. Uh, Ross is here. I don't know if Sarah is here. Uh, and a new person, Chris, is with them. And these folks do an awful lot for uh, the prosperity of all of us and the freedoms uh, that we have. And, and they are, as many of you that are legislators know, they, they're there to uh, help direct not only what may happen in the State House, but in Greg's, uh, I'll speak about Greg for a second. If, if you look at the media in this state, when there's an issue that is uh, front and center on the pa front page of the news, they always turn to Greg Moore, who has a depth of knowledge of the state, of the politics of the state, and, and I, for one, as a taxpayer and, and as a freedom-loving New Hampshire citizen, appreciate that. Right. Thank you. The other thing I'd like to recognize is all of the folks, and I know there are many folks here that are in the legislature and the Senate. Senator Ward is here, and uh, this past week I was on a Zoom uh, legislative meeting with the Senate, and uh, which I don't like being on Zoom, and uh, I didn't have my IT person there, my grandson, 17-year-old Jayden, to help me. <laughs> And therefore, when the senator asked me uh, to testify, uh, I started talking. I could see them on my screen, but they couldn't hear me. <laughs> I didn't. I don't know if I muted myself. I don't. I wouldn't have any idea how to mute myself and, uh, uh, or unmute. And so, anyways, I ended up. Uh, calling in and, and got my uh, my thoughts across and uh, the committee voted uh, in favor of that and I appreciate that Senate award Great. and hopefully the full Senate will that was on House Bill 284 I believe anyways uh, thank you all that are in the Senate and the legislature or any other political position in, in the state of New Hampshire because uh, it it's a service that you're providing for the citizens of this state, and, and I thank you for it. I know the citizens do also. Um, one other group that I'd like to say thank you to is our veterans, and I know they're veterans here, and I appreciate deeply what uh, you folks do for our freedoms in this country. I don't have a real lot uh, to add to what uh, was said. Uh, I think everything Greg said uh, is, is about it, but I will tell you from a little perspective of a, of a tree farmer in the state of New Hampshire, um, even though this riot was extremely important, and in my opinion was the spark that started the uh, what happened at the Boston Tea Party and then uh, a few years later the Revolutionary War. It was those men in where, and I'm sure there were some women involved, um, that said enough is enough and we're not going to go any further. And they stood for what they believed in and, and they were right. Um, on the way down I was thinking, you know, 249 years later, um, maybe I should be looking at the New Hampshire timber tax that I have to pay every time I cut <laughs> timber. <laughs> but it was a different time, uh, and it, it really, I think, started that the, the process forward. People, it, it, word spread that, uh, you know, we're not going to take this anymore. We're not going to take it laying down. We're going to stand firm and we're going to fight for our rights and our freedoms. And I think. Greg also alluded to that, and I believe that each and every one of us needs to stand up. Uh, I won't even get going on what's going on in Washington, D.C. today, but I will tell you this. 
1973, uh, there was an article that was written by my father, who had just become governor of the state of New Hampshire. And in that article, he referenced, he was upset with the federal government and the way they were spending money and the national debt that was being piled on to this country and to our citizens. And uh, for every man, woman, and child then, what upset my father so much, every man, woman, and child owned, owed just under $4,000. Today, after this latest mess that we've gone through, uh, almost a $2 trillion uh, that was in that COVID package, which only 9% of it was for actually COVID. The rest of it was for bailing out blue states and, and cities. Uh, it's now up over $85,000 per man, woman, and child. And, and that's something that, that people should think about every day because they're, they're, now they want to come out with another $2 trillion uh, for uh, infrastructure, which from the reports I've heard, it's uh, just a fraction, just like the COVID bill. It's all about paying back some of the, the blue states and so on and so forth. Getting back to uh, the pine tree riot, and, and you see these two examples uh, which came off our tree farm. Uh, the the 24 inch, I can't remember exactly, but could someone read how many board feet? 425. Okay, 425? Okay, thank you. And, and then the 12 inch is I think 95? Okay. That's a huge difference uh, in, in the amount of lumber that you can get out of, uh, of those two sizes. The 24 inch was already protected. Uh, the king had already had rules on that, that anything 24 inches and up, the landowner could not cut. Then they passed uh, the 12 inch. So you, you had to have the surveyor come in to, onto your property that you that plan on a home and have them go through it and they would mark the 12 inch trees that they wanted to maintain for the for the king uh, and grow and obviously those were the nice straight 12 inch pieces that were going to grow into huge uh, trees for the mass for their ships everything else you had to get could, you could cut, but you had to get a license to do it, and it was a very expensive for those landowners to do that. So it, all of that was happening, and then the mills, you know, they couldn't uh, have, they're not supposed to have anything bigger than 12 inch, uh, but a lot of them were um, good, good old Yankees, and they figured out, okay, if a 24 inch log comes in, we're gonna cut that in, up and, and then split those boards into 12 inch boards so if they ever check you know we don't have 24 inch stock here or even bigger uh, and they did catch them I think it was uh, right here where they caught them with uh, some some trees had 36 inch bucks on them so they were pretty big trees but it, the taxes uh, that they had to pay the uh, or the licenses that they had to pay and then they came and, and confiscated the logs from the different mills. All of that came together at one time and it just, these, these folks just said enough is enough and that's it. So that's, you know, that's a, it's a great story. Uh, I hope that next year at the 250th anniversary we can get it out to the media and, and get other people thinking about that. Uh, it's not just this folks in, in this uh, room and outside uh, that have followed this, but we need to get that message out to, to other people in this, in this state. And, and I think uh, I'm happy to help Greg on that in any way. So thank you very much for coming, folks. Thank you. 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 By the way, Tom brings the best props of, of anyone, so to the axe and the wood, he's like, he's, he's got the king of the props. I, I, if we're going to start, if we're going to, first of all, thank you, Senator Ward and, and Senator Daniels in back. Thank you, Senator. I know there's a bunch of representatives I see. Uh, I, I see John Patusik. I see Glenn Cordelli. I see Mike Yakubovich back there. I, I see Mark Gordon. I, 
Uh, there's a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, where's Jason? Jason's back there. Jason, o Majority Leader Jason Osborne is here too. So, Scott Wallace. So thanks, thanks to you guys. And I, and I think that, that, that the fact that we have our legislators joining us shows just how much the spirit of, of the folks who did the Pine Tree Ride is still alive and well in the New Hampshire legislature. So I really appreciate you guys showing up. One programming note, there are t-shirts. Feel free to grab one. They're very, they're very handsome. They're in the back. <laughs> so feel free, grab them. Grab them. There's also pine buses. And again, I'll say it one, one more time. We actually have a contemporaneous report that came out of the New Hampshire Gazette. Um, there's some over by the door, on a table by the door. So if you'd like, if you'd like to grab one, uh, it, it is in a little bit of old English, so you'll, so it'll be a little, a little bit of fun to read. Um, but the next person speaking is someone who, who takes the Pine Tree Riot seriously. How serious? Well, you know, we think it's, we're serious because we have an event commemorating the Pine Tree Riot. He named his business after the Pine Tree Riot. Uh, that's like the old adage about, about uh, ham and eggs. Uh, there's a di difference between uh, commitment and... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, he, he's, he's really serious about it. Uh, Carl Soderberg, in addition to being, being a veteran, he's also, uh, he's also uh, a, a, a brewer, Abel Ebenezer. And he makes the best t-shirts. I like these t-shirts. His t-shirts are better than ours. So with that, Carl... Um, one thing I love about this event is that zero of the politicians get to talk, but they let the beer guy talk. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I love telling this story at our bar, um, and, and I, one of the big things to me is like, not that I, I mean, I love telling the story, but I love that our customers love the story, and a lot of them have never heard of it before. It's not taught in the schools um, locally. Uh, I agree with you, Tom. It should totally be a big part, and I, I you know, we're, we're doing our small piece of that. Um, but thank you to all of you for coming out. Like, this is probably the biggest turnout I've seen at this event, um, and I think we all know why. Uh, it's been a hell of a year, right? Uh, so instead of like uh, talking about the story, um, I, I really want to reiterate what Tom was saying about how important this event is and how important telling the story is, um, because you're talking about. I, the, the perspective of this was the frontier back then. That's also why the story, a lot of people are like, why is the Boston Tea Party so much wider told than this story? Well, you know, Boston had academics, they had schools, they had newspaper writers, they had reporters. Um, where New Hampshire didn't? The uh, vast majority of them probably weren't even literate. Uh, they were frontiersmen, they took on the challenge of conquering the frontier so that Boston could be built, so that Portsmouth could be built, so that Exeter could be built. Um, and then the government came out here and told them that their product of their labor was not the product of their labor. Um, and I think it's important on another level of, you're talking about these backwoodsmen who were keeping to themselves, who got pushed to a point. And so the flag that's flying out, you see these, these uh, pine tree flags, like, so this is the flag of New England. Uh, it's a pine tree flag. This is actually the main battle flag from Bunker Hill. That's where it first flew. Uh, there are multiple pine tree flags that militiamen from New Hampshire, uh, when they designed their battle flags, they put the, the eastern white pine tree onto it as a nod to the men of the pine tree riot because to what Greg was saying, it was a huge deal. This was a huge deal that these backwoodsmen in New Hampshire, which if you lived in Georgia at the time, you probably haven't even heard of New Hampshire. Uh, <laughs> but this made national news that these bumpkins got away with sticking it to the government. And then you wonder why between 1772 and 1775, there was a domino effect of civil disobedience up and down the colonies. Then all those small events end up uh, like, I guess, uh, compile and roll it up into everything that happened in Boston and Massachusetts, and that was kind of the match that lit the American Revolution, uh, was when the British marched out of Boston to seize the arms from the, the country folk in Lexington and Concord. Um, but I think everybody has that point that they're pushed to, and I think it's, it's not a crazy thing to say that people do have, I don't know, it, it's not, Someone will probably try to say that it's controversial to say that, but it isn't. People get pushed to a point. When you, when you mess with somebody's livelihood to a point where um, they just can't take it anymore, 
So the flag that's outside, the appeal to heaven flag is my favorite. Uh, and a lot of people don't know where that term appeal to heaven comes from. It's from John Locke uh, in the um, 1600s. He actually was, uh, he, he was exiled from England over that idea. Um, but a lot of his ideas are what a uh, hundred years later turned into the American Revolution, uh, the Declaration of Independence. Um, a lot of his words are in the, uh, the Declaration and the Constitution. Um, an appeal to heaven is the idea of uh, and I'll paraphrase it from his treatises of government, but when there's an injustice, you have multiple appeals that you go through to try and get justice. You appeal to your ballot box by going to vote. You appeal to the judges if you feel like you've been wronged. You appeal to your politicians, your neighbors. At the end of the day, when, you, when all of those end up with a door shut in your face and you're right back where you started, the appeal to heaven, they didn't have another really way to describe it, but if push comes to shove and we have to fight back, God is going to fall on the side of the, the righteous, the just. So they believed that if you go kinetic with it, sorry, I'm a veteran. Uh, <laughs> if that day ever comes, God is going to come on our, is going to fall on the right side. And if, and we, if we believe that we are just and right, we know that we'll win the fight. Um, so that's where the term appeal to heaven comes from, appeal to God, appeal to heaven. Um, and uh, so that flag was actually selected by George Washington uh, when he arrived in Cambridge and he converted uh, six uh, small merchant ships into gunboats where privateers harassed the British off the, the shores of Massachusetts. They were awesome. Uh, but that was, he chose the Eastern White Pine Tree as a nod to the Pine Tree Riot and he chose uh, an appeal to heaven uh, a statement from John Locke about uh, the the point that these men in the backwoods of New Hampshire were pushed to where they couldn't take it anymore it's like live for your die right death a lot of people so live for your die very popular obviously in the state of New Hampshire but what should be just as popular is the second part of that statement where death is not the worst of evils so thank you guys very much for coming out We'll keep doing our part to keep telling the story. Um, I mean, we have the people ask about our logo, the broad arrow. We really try to tell these stories, and I think that simply telling the story, because the, the big thing is that all of us agree, and people who won't show up to this event, people that we disagree with, we all agree that the American Revolution was a good thing, that it had good premises behind it. Um, so I think that continuing to tell the story and continuing to proliferate it brings more people to the table um, I'm really looking forward to next year it's gonna be a real banger <laughs> thank you guys all for coming out cheers to you guys. Thank, thanks Carl uh, next person is a, is a person who graciously turned turned over this barn to us for use today and I really appreciate uh, Howard and Martha Kalugi and really allowing us to come in here and so uh, this was, now we, I'll admit, I'll admit, Carl did say no politicians, uh, but, but I, gotta, I gotta tell you, Howard is a recovering politician, but he's not a politician anymore. So Howard's great, uh, and, and I mean, he came to Weir, New Hampshire for the same reason that the Pine Tree Riots happened here. So Howard. Thank you. Yes, we came here from California. We escaped California to come to freedom. We moved to America when we came here. We're just so happy to be here. We really are. Well, the Pine Tree Ride is something that I didn't know anything about until I moved here, and I'm really glad we're able to host it, and thank you for putting all this great work together. You know, I don't want to really say anything else other than to welcome you to our property and to our barn, and I hope that you enjoyed the day. I would mention, though, since they talked about the debt that was being accumulated, do you know that they've spent so much money trying to stimulate an economy that they closed down, that if all they did was said that in 2020 we don't have to pay any income taxes, that would have stimulated the economy and spent less than they did. We, they only collect $3.5 trillion in income taxes on an annual basis, and they've spent more than that trying to stimulate the economy. But if they had just simply given us a tax forgiveness for 2020, there would have been no corruption, there would have been no cost of distribution, it would not have caused anybody to have uh, disincentive to work, it would have been beautiful. 
So those are the kind of people that we need to send to Washington, D.C. Yeah. in the future. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Howard. And then our, our final speaker is my old boss. <laughs> so uh, I used to work for uh, Speaker O'Brien when he was Speaker of the House. Uh, he too is now a recovering politician. Uh, I'm not sure if he's recovering as well as, Ho as Howard is, but <laughs> but, but uh, Bill O'Brien helped create a budget back in 2011 that set the stage for a number of positive steps that have allowed us as a, as a state to thrive. And without the, the, the courage of conviction to make those changes in 2011, we wouldn't have the opportunity to have the type of thriving economy we have here, despite the best efforts of, of some folks down in Washington to hold that in its tracks. So with that, I'll let Bill O'Brien close us out. Thank you, Greg. Uh, you know, I really appreciate you inviting me here and, and holding this, this event. Uh, it's the third time I've spoken at this, and, and uh, you know, I've appreciated the last two times. Tommy Thompson and I really do appreciate you celebrating our efforts back in 1773. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Tommy. <laughs> you know, the, the last two times I, I showed up, they were less challenging than now. Um, we've gone through a period where, as Greg mentioned, in one term we were able to reduce the size of uh, New Hampshire government effectively by 18%. We had had Donald Trump elected uh, to the presidency. We, we had a, an environment that was conducive to growing conservative and liberal, liberty, libertarian principles. And, and now the times are more challenging. Um, but groups are standing up to it. The New Hampshire House, for example, has passed a great budget and great legislation this time. It is challenged, it's challenged um, in Concord, it's challenged by an administration that's trying to rob the states of sovereignty by, for example, passing laws that say no state can reduce taxes if they want to take um, uh, uh, any sort of aid from the government. We have, we're challenged by a national election that was marred by fraud. Um, we're challenged by a president in the White House who doesn't even know hardly, as we can tell, the circumstances surrounding him. But he does know to put together an administration that is going to be the worst progressive administration from the, since the excesses of Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, Lind Lyndon Johnson. We face these challenges. We do, we, the, the Congress does know what surrounds them. They're surrounded by barbed wire because they're afraid of the people of the United States. And, and they are intent on destroying our liberty and our Constitution. We could be discouraged. We could be discouraged by events that have occurred. We could be discouraged by the lies. And we know the lies. Lies that, that challenge what we see. The, the lies that say a biological man can by declaration become a woman. The lies that say that unarmed trespassers are insurrectionists. But, but Black Lives Matter and Antifa murderers and thugs are mostly peaceful. And, and lies that say that critical race theory, telling us that race is more important about a person than his character. We know these are lies. And so, you know, as we look to the future, we say, where do these lies take us? And, and I, there's one bit of encouragement, you know, I was just reading it this morning. Uh, we have a president that stands up. We have a hundred corporate leaders that stand up and say Georgia is racist because it passed a voter ID law. And yet, 75% of the people in consistent polling know that's false. These big lies are not being believed anymore. 75 know that it's false. 19% says that they are, uh, they, they believe it. I want to talk about that 19%. Because I, I wrote an article that was published a couple of days ago in the New Hampshire Journal. And, you know, we've all faced people that you, you'll say um, something that is, they'll say something to you, just know that, that isn't true. You know, 
a, a man can't become a woman. It's just, you know, they can, they can um, be confused about it, but they can't become a woman. Um, and um, so, so I asked myself why, and I thought back, and I'll leave you with this. There's a great book to read, and it's by a great writer. Her name is Joan Didion. Joan Didion um, is not a political person. She wrote a, a book about the death of her husband. She used to collaborate with her husband in, in her literary works. And her grief was so intense that she could not, not even, it wasn't she couldn't talk about, she didn't want to accept, she couldn't know of her husband's death. You know, she'd talk about incidents, for example, where she would make dinner and then go set the table and then sit at the, the table waiting for her husband to come out of the office because um, she couldn't know that she's, he was dead. The, the left's grief would be equally intense if they accept reality. That is why when we look at something and we say that's just not true, why they continue to assert it. Why they continue to assert there was Russian collusion. Why they continue to assert all the fictions that we're hearing about. And the solution we have are events like this, is talking to them, never lose spirit, continue to talk with them. And then and the same thing will happen with them that happened with Joan Didion. She had to return to reality. They will return to reality. Thank you. Well, that's our program. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. There is still food. Please eat. As I said, grab a T-shirt. Grab a pint glass if there are any left. Uh, we'd love to love to go home with less than you came with. And if anybody wants a photo with the axe, well, be nice to Tom and maybe let you do it. Thank you, everybody.